There are so many things to um, keep talking about. First, I want I just want to have to raise more of a philosophical question because you again talked about how resilient democracies are. We can turn the question upside down, saying how resilient are authoritarian regimes to democratic change. I mean, Russia and China, as you're saying, they're using a lot of resources to keep the society from developing in a, in a democratic way. And also the more basic philosophical question is, is human nature inclined to democratic development or are we more inclined to authoritarianism? Can you just respond to that question before we go into more of the details about developments in Hungary and so on? Jürgen, maybe you can start on that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, to, um, so uh, that's uh, uh, an excellent uh, question, the way you uh, flop it around uh, uh, like that. Uh, so how resilient are authoritarian uh, countries? So I'll stay with the interwar period because uh, that was basically what I came uh, here to talk about. Uh, I think uh, the interwar period is a, a good illustration uh, of the fact that uh, in, uh, uh, even in the 20th century, uh, 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 there was uh, quite some room for uh, authoritarianism. Uh, uh, and I think that this uh, comparison between the old and the new democracies, uh, so I, uh, what I took out of it was just how uh, resilient these old democracies were. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that was something that happened after a very long uh, historical uh, period. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in that sense, you can say that to get really stable democracy, that's also a very uh, long uh, road that is uh, really written with, uh, with obstacles. Uh, this does not necessarily mean that authoritarian countries are uh, stable uh, within the regimes they have, uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, it can be very difficult to cross, uh, uh, so to speak, the border to stable uh, democracy and there will be a lot of uh, fallback uh, uh, along the way. Uh, uh, but you can have unstable uh, authoritarianism uh, which relapses into other kinds of authoritarianism every time they uh, break down. That's also something we have seen uh, even after uh, the Cold War. Mm. Yeah. Valentin, is the Chinese uh, regime, are they, will they be able to eternally sustain or contain the, the censorship, the suppression of the democratic forces in China? Mm -hmm. So I think at the moment um, and in the past they were successful because they were able to do censorship and maintain economic growth mm -hmm. um, with the targets they set out and um, it was that's also where a lot of countries are seeing that as a good uh, way to manage their domestic system and um, they say oh we don't even need to become democratic in order be, to be pros prosperous right we can keep our hybrid or authoritarian regime and we can um, keep up economic growth so I think if they keep on um, having a booming economy as they do um, uh, still do um, compared to other countries they will be able to um, maintain that system abro um, at, so at home, but also abroad. So it's about the economy. Mm. Yeah. James, you're saying that uh, uh, some Western leaders foolishly regard Russia as a potential partner still, and you obviously think that is a stupid idea. And uh, Espen, who sits here, might be able to comment on that, but still, I mean, for Norway, we have a border with Russia. We have to work with Russia. And so I get it, Lavrov is invited to the, the anniversary of the liberation of the northern part of Norway this year. And that's sort of, as far as I understand, that's the policy that we have to have in Norway in order to have a living relationship with somebody who never invaded us. They actually saved us. <laughs> and uh, how can you say that? How can you be so certain about uh, Russia not being a potential partner for Western Europe? The Baltic states have a border with Russia as well, and they've had a different experience, and Ukraine had a different experience, and I could go on and on. Um, I don't, you know, I don't begrudge the Norwegian government for having diplomatic relations with Russia. The United States has diplomatic relations with Russia. What do you mean but then I, by not? Being well, I, a when I say partner, I mean something like you know Nord Stream two, like engaging in massive commercial enterprises mm -hmm. that are unnecessary, that are part of a strategic political plan. Um, that are used to undermine the cohesion of the European Union, the transatlantic community. They're actually against EU policy. I mean, we hear a lot about how you know, unilateral 
uh, the United States has become under Donald Trump and how, how wonderful of a team player Germany is and how wonderful Europeans the Germans always are. But I mean, this Nord Stream 2 is such a contradiction of that. Uh, I could point to any number of other relationships that European governments have with, with Russia that are um, uh, not showing solidarity with our European, our own other European allies, or countries that aspire to become part of Europe, like Georgia and Ukraine. Hmm. Also, you don't agree with that. I don't. Uh, basically, there are two views of what to do with a country such as uh, such as Russia. You know, Bob Jervis outlined it in the book 1976: Perceptions and Misperceptions in, in, in International Politics. So basically. We have to ask ourselves, is Russia uh, out there to uh, tear up the international order? Is it a re revisionist country that wants to change um, the established order? Or is it a country that feels threatened and lashes out? And uh, it's fair. You can arguments, make arguments for both. I think that uh, we would get a lot further with Russia um, trying to engage and to take their concerns seriously. And I think... Uh, but, you know, like, I'm, I, I was impressed with an analysis of a Swedish political scientist called Rudolf Chilen. He wrote about this in, uh, before World War I, where he argues that former great powers are more dangerous uh, than rising powers. So don't focus so much about China. That's going, we are diverting so much attention towards China, and we don't fully... Um, we're not, we don't take into account the effects of our actions on Russia, and I think that the chances of a... Funda of a great miscalculation against Russia that we do for some other recent domestic politics in the United States or Brexit or what have you, uh, can spark a reaction from a country that is not weak but feels weakened and feels under threat that might be completely disproportionate. And for that, uh, for that reason, I think the, West, uh, the best way forward with Russia is engagement, drawing on those roots that Fyodor was pointing out, that we do have the benefit of a shared cultural he heritage and uh, a very long and unhappy Cold War uh, marriage that we can build on. Short question. Do you agree with the former Norwegian Prime Minister, Kåre Willock, who recently said that Europe should lift the sanctions against, against Russia? Uh, that we, we cannot and we will not re re lift the sanctions against Russia unless there is a resolve, uh, resolving the Ukrainian crisis. And I think that is something that is being discussed in Moscow and that is something that uh, uh, the President uh, Putin uh, has persuaded himself that the ball is in Europe and the United States uh, court, while we very firmly feel and have agreed that Russia uh, has transgressed and there need to be a process forward with a momentum uh, that restores sovereignty to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we need to do, discuss what is going to happen to, uh, to uh, um, Crimea. Uh, but from our point of view, it has to be an international settlement around this. We cannot accept uh, uh, the, uh, the precedence of what happened. Mm. And that is where it stands now. And I think future dialogue. Uh, um, Foreign Minister Lavrov is a very reasonable man. Mm. Uh, he is uh, a representative of the Kremlin, but he's, it's possible to, do, to talk with him. Unfortunately, we have arrived at an impasse where we are not being able to move forward on dis to topics that are in our mutual interest. And that is a problem. James, you had a comment? I actually agree with both of those interpretations of Russia's behavior. I think they do, they are a revisionist power. And I think they do feel threatened. But what do they feel threatened by? They feel threatened by countries that they use to subjugate being democratic and making their own sovereign democratic decisions. They're not afraid that NATO is going to invade them. They're afraid that Ukraine might become a member of the EU and become a democracy, a Russian-speaking democracy of 47 million people, which which, they, uh, which Vladimir Putin sees as a threat. Now the question is, do you think that that's a legitimate thing to feel threatened by? I don't, mm. because I don't think that we won the Cold War only to have 30 years later Russia emerge again and say, you know what, we're actually going to invade these countries again that we lost 30 years ago. That's not why we won the Cold War. And part of winning the Cold War wasn't just the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of Marxist-Leninism. It was to enshrine the right of small countries in Europe to be able to be equal when it comes to things like making their own decisions when it comes to joining security alliances and multilateral organizations. Mm -hmm. It's not Russia's choice. They don't get a veto. They don't get a say in whether or not Georgia or Ukraine or the Baltic states or Poland or Norway gets to be a member of NATO or the EU or any other institution. I'll 
open up for questions soon, but I just have to ask us, us I know that you also disagree with James when it comes to, <laughs> to Hungary. You portray Hungary as more democratic than James does. Well, the, the, problem, the problem here is, uh, you know, when we go into this debate where we decide to, de to deal in only two colors, black and white, mm -hmm. a lot of nuances are lost. And I think when it comes to Ukraine, Ukraine is not going to be a member of NATO. Uh, you know, there I said it. They're not going to be a member of NATO. Whether they want to or not, they will not become a member of NATO. Uh, that message has been well received. You know, it's been received in European capitals. The Europeans blocked MAP membership at the Bucharest summit, and I think that the Europeans would do so again if uh, an application would be uh, on the table again. And uh, I <laughs> about about uh, about Hungary, I'm, not, I'm no great fan of uh, of Viktor Orban or his Fidesz movement, or about you know the fascist thugs of the Jobbik movement. I'm not a fan of the restricting of the free media in in Hungary, or of you know the plethora of uh, illiberal uh, quotes that has come from uh, from Viktor Orban's mouth. What I'm just saying is that on the one hand, and just we, let's double back to the Economist. I mentioned it in the uh, in my presentation. The Economist has been hammering uh, 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 Hungary now for all their transgressions, and rightly so. And then they publish a uh, a map of um, uh, of global uh, of democracy, and lo and behold, it turns out that uh, uh, that they they rank uh, Hungary as the most democratic country of the region. Why? Because they, it's a quantitative analysis with 50 various uh, indicators. They feed the, the the data into the into the computer, and it seems that. For all its weaknesses, uh, Hungary also has very strong, strong, uh, strong sides. So instead of Freedom House doesn't say that. Freedom there House doesn't. All, all okay. sorts of NGOs don't say. That. I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd be curious to know what yeah. what factors the Economist is using to yeah, make that okay. judgment. Because we'll, I'm not we'll aware of any other. That, <laughs> that that. I think you'll have time before dinner to discuss that. <laughs> that uh, you're going to have one more, uh, one more question for you before I open up uh, the, for the audience. Um, uh, history repeats itself, and but it at the same time it doesn't. And when you're saying that um, the strong democracies are resilient and or the countries that have been democratic for a long time, they are resilient to crisis. But then in the 30s, they didn't have uh, propaganda through social media. They didn't have uh, uh, this uh, massive uh, lying machines that sort of pour uh, lies into our democratic systems. Uh, are stable democracies like the United States and France and Norway, are they threatened by that, this new factor when it comes to analyzing democracies? So you, you are forcing me back to the theme of the panel because I didn't really yes. uh, talk about digital uh, <laughs> politics uh, yeah. and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of, uh, I mean, um, should we be complacent about uh, today's challenges? Uh, no, this is not the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make. I'm, I'm trying to make two points. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one is that uh, the uh, challenges that we see today differ fundamentally from what we saw in the 1930s. Uh, and the worries about uh, democratic fragility cannot be sustained by a closer look at the interwar experience. Mm. Uh, but then secondly, if, uh, 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 when we compare these two um, periods with each other, uh, it's quite obvious to me that, um, uh, that democracies are much more battled, hardened, uh, as uh, Runciman uh, 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 terms it in, uh, in his new book, uh, today than they were back in the 20s and 30s. The crisis we are experiencing now are uh, bad in, in many ways, but, uh, but uh, it's still much less than what we saw, especially in the 1930s. Uh, and we have democracies uh, with uh, much higher levels of uh, affluence. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, I would say that uh, the democratic stability uh, uh, is likely to be much bigger, uh, much higher today than it uh, was uh, in the interwar period. The mm. problem with your thesis is it doesn't sell books. You make, it makes so much sense, but it doesn't sell books. <laughs> um, well, Valentin, we'll about <laughs> Valentin how, how efficient are the Russian uh, propaganda machines in order to destroy our democracies? Oof. <laughs> depends on um, who you ask, I suppose. Um, yeah. uh, it depends also on the country. Um, I think uh, in the US, um, they were uh, leading um, some discourse, but there were again other st uh, stories or uh, research showing that Fox News actually had a bigger impact than the Russians had. Okay. 
um, in steering discussion. But uh, Fox News is not a propaganda machine, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let just uh, we'll let that hang there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think they were more effective because there was less uh, counterweight um, in the p previous years. But now platforms are being forced uh, to manage their content and uh, mm -hmm. gain responsibility, mm -hmm. um, and therefore they're taking um, lots of bots, uh, Russian bots, down on um, their fake accounts and so on. So I think mm -hmm. we're getting better at making them less productive in their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I have one person who has raised his hand already in the middle there, and everybody who are taking the floor, introduce yourselves and where <coughs> you come from. Yeah, hello again. Uh, my name is Bjarne Eikefjord, and I'm from the uh, International Forum Board of the Labour Party in Oslo. Uh, I have two specific questions, but first, it's a very interesting debate over democracy and eroding democracy we are here. And I would like to remind the audience and also the board, if you uh, have not heard it before, about the saying from uh, a great statesman in the last century that a dictatorship is like a warship in iron and high speed under discipline, but if it hits a mine or a rock, it goes down with all the hands on board. A democracy is like a fleet. You are on a fleet of timber logs. You get wet on your feet, but you will always float as long as the timber doesn't rotten from inside. Question, please. So, yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. the question. Uh, and the question goes to Asli Toya. Uh, when I hear you about banonization of social media, um, that is a kind of, in my uh, perception, uh, banalization is to present the lies as they were facts and repeat and repeat and more and more uh, tangling with the facts. And I would like to ask you, is this inevitable? Uh, or is it possible to, uh, to change um, uh, this? What should the democracy do to protect itself about that way of of uh, disturbing people. And okay. the second question yeah, is... No, I think we'll have one question. Okay. Uh, there's one, we take one more question, Halvard uh, uh, Anakan. There is one more question, one more person there, we take uh, one more question. You know that, Asli? Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for interesting um, presentations. My name is Halvard Notaker, I'm a historian affiliated with the University of Oslo. Uh, and my question goes to uh, uh, Mr. Madrid. Uh, good name in the news these days. Um, as a historian, I, I know that social scientists love a good two by four table. Uh, to me, it simplifies a little too much and, and maybe leaves out uh, a few factors. Uh, what I would like to know is whether, uh, how, whether in your research you found anything to uh, explain how changes happen that are not uh, caught in your black and white, either or presentation, because as I gather, what many people worry about um, security policy and the use of social media is not whether Norway will turn into a dictatorship, but whether democracy will function less well as a result perhaps of influence operations and whether that will weaken readiness because people don't know who to trust. And I, I, think, I think your analysis uh, somewhat misses that point and Perhaps uh, I'll leave all of my yeah. historical beef for another time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think I think we will uh, let uh, Asla and uh, Jürgen respond to those two questions. Well, the the point in my pres presentation is well is that freedom works. It really does. That is the strength of democracy, and with the banalization of the web, we have seen uh, some uh, some problems certainly. Uh, but the main story here is that we've seen a broadening of the deb debate, giving voice to widely held views that were not fully represented in the media, which is good for democracy. This is how we move forward. Democracy is always noisy, nasty and unsatisfactory, uh, but it keeps on delivering and that's because we keep on having these discussions with ourselves and we have very few things that you cannot say in a democracy and we shouldn't start uh, uh, cl closing down the debate. Uh, I don't think that, uh, that Breitbart is uh, you know, a front for Russia or a great, or, you know, a great uh, inventor of fake news, but certainly they have been much slower than the mainstream media to retract stories when they're found to be, uh, found to be false. They do retract them, they don't grovel and apologize, but they, 
uh, but they do in the end. And I guess it's part of the learning process of, a new, of new media houses that they become responsible step by step. But the overall story is that freedom works. Let's not be so fretful. Hmm. Jürgen? Yeah. Uh, so thanks uh, a lot for this um, uh, very relevant question. Uh, the point of the interwar analogy is actually exactly that we should worry about genuine democratic breakdown today. And this is a message that is made in many of these books. Uh, uh, and that is, of course, the message that we're trying to counter uh, with uh, this uh, analysis. Uh, now, having said that, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, we can argue that uh, it's very, 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 very unlikely that old democracies will break down, uh, at least based on a historical perspective, uh, obviously does not rule out that there can be a loss in democratic uh, quality. Uh, and uh, again, today's uh, challenges obviously differ from those of the uh, 1930s. Uh, and. Uh, 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 even uh, if I uh, really wanted to pressure our analysis, I cannot make it uh, tell us anything uh, about uh, how uh, our democracies today will respond to uh, the advent of social media with respect to democratic quality. That's something that should really be studied in the context of today's democracies, not via such a historical uh, uh, perspective or comparison. Uh, uh, however, uh, I would want to single out one more difference between the interwar period and uh, today, which I think is, is, is uh, quite uh, indicative. Uh, and that is uh, the extent to which democracy is accepted as the rule um, uh, of the uh, game today uh, in um, um, countries uh, uh, such as uh, Denmark and Norway, uh, but also, uh, of course, in North America. And, uh, uh, at this point, also in large parts of uh, uh, Latin America, parts of Africa, south of uh, the Sahara, and uh, in large parts uh, of uh, Asia. And one uh, indication of that is that we virtually do not find uh, uh, what, uh, when we look at the interwar period, uh, is, uh, are termed anti-system parties. That is, parties that want something else uh, from democracy. Uh, we find these populist parties that work within democracy, we might, from a normative uh, democratic perspective, disagree with some of their aims, uh, but we do not find uh, parties, with a very few exceptions, uh, uh, that actually want something else than uh, democracy in Western Europe and Northern America today. Mm. We have a few more minutes, so the next uh, speaker from the floor is the Hungarian ambassador, please. Thank you very much. There, I, think, I think there is, uh, no, just, you just yeah. speak. Thank, Thank you very much for giving me the time. Uh, well, first of all, it's a great honor to, uh, to be part of the voodoo doll that Hungary seems to have become. Uh, we do have a lot of Hungarians in the world who became very famous, many of them in the United States. One of them was Roja Gabor. She had a very <laughs> famous saying in very Hungarian accent that, don't worry, there is no bad publicity, just publicity. I think it was Oscar Wilde who said that. Yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> so basically the bad publicity that uh, also sells your books uh, needs Hungary as it was singled out. But I'd like to thank Asla very much and Tova for giving me the time to maybe just cloud the issue slightly with facts. One, the personal thing you said about the CEU is that if any one of you want to enroll their child to the CEU in September, it does open in Budapest more than 200 places, and there are 1,400 current students enrolled there. From the other personal side of it is that uh, you said that some of, these, some of these democracies came late and therefore they're fragile. Yes, the reason we came late to the party as democracy is because the 20th century didn't quite work out for Eastern Europe or Central Europe. It depends on which way you want to look at it. Do you have a question uh, for James? Or no, um, no, no, the yeah. question, three more sentences, okay. if, you, if you allow me, yeah. um, to put the other side. And that is, uh, we came late to the party and therefore democracy is something we still believe in. We believe that when everybody says there are free elections and everybody says there are free elections, then a government of a country is actually leg legitimate and is to be listened to. Uh, the other one is that free speech is actually allowed. So sometimes we say things that others don't want to hear or don't dare to say. It means that you don't have to be ostracized for that. And Orban Victor may be a difficult person. Um, on the other hand, uh, Mr. Kerchik, 
you agree with him. Because what he says is the reason there's such personal dislike for him is because he called the elephant in the room, which is immigration in Europe. And that is something nobody wants to hear. But let me tell you, this is also personal for me. Calling Hungary closest to Russia with all the other countries around here is just despicable. My grandfather was in Siberia. My father was on the streets in 56. And I was on the streets in the 80s. So do not dare to say any of that in front of so many people without a Hungarian representative there to have at least an equal chance. OK. Thank you. Thank you. James, do you have a response to that? Um, yeah, I find uh, it most perplexing, given the history of Hungary and what it suffered under Russia, which is precisely why I find it so disheartening and perplexing that the Hungarian government seems to be uh, moving in a direction that is closer to Russia. This is Viktor Orban's own words, his own policies uh, that demonstrate this, what they're doing with Ukraine, using this uh, language law issue to prevent cooperation with NATO and Ukraine. The list goes on and on. I find it, uh, it, it particularly because of the, the history of, of people like yourself, that I find it so disappointing that the Hungarian government is apparently pursuing these policies. Hmm. Do you have a comment on <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, we, we should be a bit more charitable towards each other. And I think that, you know, like these, these debates, uh, we can use them to, uh, to, demonize, to demonize each other. Um, uh, but a country like, uh, like Hungary, sure, uh, it is different from most Western Euro European countries. But come on, guys, travel a little. So is Poland, so is Czech, so is Slovakia, so is Bulgaria, so is Romania, so is Moldova. Uh, and I think in some ways, you know, the Hungarians are catching a lot of slack because they insist on talking English all the time. So you really need to look to, <laughs> that, uh, look to that. And China is the big investor in all these countries. Well, how does that affect these countries' development? Um, mostly, I think, um, they're investing where other companies wouldn't invest, I think, or mo more Western European companies as well, especially in the mobile telecommunications market. Um, Europe is seen as a very risky market because it's um, there's just... Uh, no profit to be made, and there um, China steps in, Huawei steps in, but again there is um, concerns, um, security concerns um, at the moment. Um, so it's uh, to be seen what's going to happen. Mm. We take one last question here at the front. Yes, uh, yes. there is. Mm. Okay. Uh, my name is Darlin, I work for the Chief of Defense, and I have a question to uh, Mr. Merlet. Uh, because you pointed several similarity when you compared the in-between war situation and today. And my question is, has you like, identified any major diff uh, differences which might increase the resilience of democracy? Today? Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I think, actually, I, I mentioned uh, a couple in one of my earlier answers. Uh, so uh, one thing is that <laughs> so much time has elapsed where these democracies have functioned uh, since the 1930s. So this democratic legacy uh, that went uh, back before uh, World War I is, of course, much longer today. Uh, this was what I meant by these democracies being more battled uh, hardened today. Uh, and uh, in, in this connection, just uh, recall that it's not such a long time ago since we uh, had another uh, crisis mood or uh, feeling of crisis. Uh, that was back in the 70s and the 80s, uh, uh, where in a sense we also had more political radicalization, I would argue, than, uh, than we have today, de depends on, on the vantage uh, point, of course. Uh, and these uh, democracies were able to channel uh, and deal with, with that uh, frustration. So one thing is that uh, the democratic experiences are much longer. Uh, secondly, these are much more affluent societies, and we know that affluence uh, stabilizes democracy. Uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, so uh, we are in the midst of uh, several uh, uh, crises today. We've just come out of a nasty economic crisis. But still, when we compare it to what we saw in the 90s, 30s, it's, it's of course not at that level. Uh, so in that sense, I also think there's a big difference, yes. And maybe when talking about fragmentation in Europe, we saw in the 70s there were red-wing terrorists who yeah, killed exactly. people in this Europe. Was my and in the United States, we have Trump. Now, a lot of people feel that he's a threat to democracy. James, to w let's round up. I mean, I can go through the panel here, but James first. Will American democracy come out strengthened or fragilized <coughs> by Trump? 
I've used this line several times before, so forgive me if you've heard it, but Donald Trump isn't a fascist, he's a golfer. Um, I, I think it's, uh, he, he's not, I mean, it's, it's unfair to fascists to compare him to, I mean, they actually get things done, you know, they make the trains run on time, he can't, he can't get his wall built, he can't get bills passed. Um, I think, you know, the notion that he's going to transform America into this authoritarian state, I find very difficult to conceive. And I actually am heartened by the reaction, uh, people getting more involved in politics, people are becoming uh, more active, they're paying more attention to the news. You're seeing younger people, in particular, get involved. I, so I actually think there's a silver lining to this, to this whole phenomenon, and I think we'll, we'll survive. I'm, I'm much less optimistic about the future of Europe mm -hmm. than I am about the United States. Okay. <laughs> Valentin, you just came from Boston. How is the state of democracy in oh, the US? in Boston. <laughs> in the US. <laughs> In the U.S., I think um, there's, um, as I think uh, you mentioned earlier, there's a politicization of, of, the, of the people, bigger and bigger division amongst people. Um, and I think um, that's the state um, within um, the U.S. I think a lot of people see that. And from the outside, I think um, a lot of countries are um, questioning whether that is the right approach to perceive democracy in this way, right? Um, it's not showing that it's... Um, approach to the future, things are not go getting done, right? Because there is division amongst people in Europe, a similar, um, a, a similar vision is seen that uh, Europe doesn't get things done. It's not as innovative as it could be, right? Um, and um, I think a lot we need to reestablish that uh, view around the world that Europe is a good place to be, democracy is a good place to be. We can get things done if we want, we can be innovative, we can do all of those things, um, I think that's the prime issue for us um, to survive in <laughs> this world. Osle, is Europe more threatened than the US? This is where I agree with James. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you're right. I think uh, basically uh, any regime, any sort of gov system of governance can retain legitimacy as long as it basically delivers two things, modicum of economic growth and security. And for the longest time now, uh, it, Last quarter, the, in the Eurozone, had a growth rate of, what, 0.2%, which is way too low. Mm. And I think that uh, if we have a rerun of the refugee crisis in Europe, I think all bets are off in some countries. And that is, is something that worries me. And that's not to detract. I, 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 do, I do think you're right, that democracies have taken more root now than in the interwar years. But... Uh, I think you know, like we need to rediscover growth. We need to. Uh, I don't. I'm. I'm not so concerned about the public discourse. I think that you know, democracy's roots need to be watered with uh, discourse and disagreements, and 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 uh, uh, and that, I think that's all good. But yeah. I think when I it think comes we to yeah, sorry, uh, it's all, all about growth. I think one concluding remark again. <laughs> uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just stop here. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you. Danish. <laughs> Modesty. <laughs> Uh, I just would like to um, wrap up this day and say it's been a long day. It's been a really interesting discussions, both this last panel, but the former as well, and in the Nobel Institute. Uh, we are continuing tomorrow. For those of you who are going to join us tomorrow, the buses are leaving at 8 sharp from the city.